everyone. It is good to see you. It's good to be in the Lord's house. Uh, it's good to have another uh, opportunity to gather and to be um, with each other. And uh, I, I, just a few announcements as we begin. Uh, I wanted to, well, in your bulletin, you will see where um, uh, the Vacation Bible School dates, we're, we're making plans. And so uh, this is for you to already be thinking, how, how can I uh, be a help? And so maybe you're, maybe you're not going to be in town during that week. You may already have a vacation scheduled, but you know that there might be some things that we'll be collecting, whether that's for crafts or uh, food uh, for the meals. And so you can already start um, uh, looking for those things and ways you could help that way. Maybe it's where you, you're going to be in town. You could help being a helper in a class, being a teacher in a class. Um, being able to, to uh, take on some of those things as well, whether that's helping with the meals or, or, or whatever else. And so all that said, uh, there's your, your uh, summer dates and uh, start praying. Start praying for the children that will be coming, the families that will be involved, the workers that will be involved. That it is a, it's not just something for the kids, but it, that, it, that God uses it for, uh, for everyone, that we can be reminded of his providence over this, uh, not just this place, but the time that we're in and how he will remind us of his faithfulness uh, through it. So um, keep that in mind. Also, you can see there in your bulletin that uh, tomorrow night, um, that is, no, it's not tomorrow night, it's next week, uh, as far as the, the uh, Lighthouse Dinner. If you've never been a part of one of those, I would just encourage you, I, uh, I'll be able to make this one myself. And so uh, Patty Dickerson or Ellen Schaefer can fill you in on kind of the times and what they need from you on that. It, let me just give you the snapshot. It's, it's right across from uh, the football stadium there downtown Cape. Um, our, our Missouri Baptist um, uh, student ministry there, uh, collegiate ministry. Uh, you, you've heard Reese. He's come here and preached before. Uh, and so on that Monday night dinner, which is a free dinner for college students, uh, actually the ones who take advantage of it uh, mostly are the international students. And so at any time, there's somewhere between 12 and 20 different nations that are represented on those Monday nights. And so you're able to come in. Now, whether you feel like you need to have a conversation with every single one of them or not, uh, just know that the, the world has come to Missouri and it's coming and showing up at our collegiate ministry building on those Monday nights. And we're not only to be able to feed them uh, a physical meal, but also the, the word, truth. And, uh, and so Reese is also working on uh, some of those nights on Monday night that he wants to begin some, some culture nights. And it's going to have a chance of, of being able to learn the culture of each one of those and for those students to learn more of what it is in American culture. And part of that is uh, our Christian heritage. And so uh, just, I just wanted to let you know that there's amazing opportunities for evangelism uh, and learning and getting to know new friends from around the globe. So if you can't make that, uh, uh, that meal or, or that time, you can be praying for those that are and uh, that the gospel is shared and that they're able to just enjoy and learn more um, uh, about our world that, this Lord, that our God has made and the people in it. Uh, so just, just keep that in mind. Also, I've been asked to remind you all that next week, immediately after service, uh, will be the Because He First Loved Us event. And so parents, children, uh, this has happened the last couple of years. Uh, there'll be pizza afterwards and, of course, uh, cupcake decorating and just a, a reminder of Christ's love for us. And so if you want to be a part of that, you want to come and, and uh, participate, there is a sign-up in the front foyer that you can sign up so they can just, you know, have a, um, a rough idea of how much pizza they're going to need, how many uh, cupcakes they're going to need. And so uh, it'd be great if you could sign up and kind of give a number of that. So don't forget, next week, immediately after service. Also, uh, Miss Sharon announced for our senior adults, uh, there is a movie coming February, what's the day, 23rd? Okay, so there, there is a, a movie that's coming out called or Ordinary Angels, uh, and so she's just trying to get interest. If anybody uh, in our senior adults want to go and watch on the 23rd, uh, if you are um, interested in that, uh, she's got to order the tickets uh, soon, uh, and so I think that she said the cost would be somewhere around $8-ish uh, for the ticket, and so you can sign up on the, the sign-up sheet, and then uh, you can figure out the ticket later on, but that way you're on the list, and we know how many are able to go. So it's February 23rd, um, if you're interested. Let me read this morning from Psalm 118. 
Uh, Psalm 118 is part of uh, a collection within the Psalms called the Hallels. Uh, this is a portion of the scripture that when they would have the Passover, they would read and they would recite, they would sing these Psalms. In 118, near uh, the kind of a little past the, the middle part of the chapter, it says, open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you've answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is a reminder of when it says that the righteous enter through that gate. Well, that's not meaning all of us that think we've finally arrived and figured it out and got everything right or that we've done more good than bad. No, no, no. We are the recipients of the grace and the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ, the the cornerstone that the builders had rejected, the, the idea that somehow Jesus being the Messiah that they couldn't understand and would not receive, but has proven over and over again that Jesus is our salvation And so when we have received the Lord, then we receive his righteousness as a gift that we are able to enter into that gate. And so what does that do for us even on this day? Well, as a reminder that this is the day that the Lord has made. It's a gift, right? We we know that he has given us another opportunity to be together, to glorify him because he's God and he is good to us. So this morning we will lift high the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ because this certainly is his day. Joe Hoffmeister, would you open us up in prayer this morning? Father, we come to you today thanking you for this Lord's Day. We thank you, Lord, for setting apart through your commandments that we should set aside one day a week to make it holy. And Father, since you rose again on this day and in history, we celebrate in your name. And it's your the reason we're here. Some have come today out of habit. Some have come for fellowship. Uh, some have come for various other reasons. But we all recognize, Lord Jesus, you are the reason we are here. We welcome you by faith to this place based upon your promise that where we are gathered in your name, you're here with us. We ask that you accept our blessing, our praises, that you accept our worship. We ask that you be pleased with us as a family of believers, worshiping you according to your commandments. We ask that you bless our leader, our pastor, as he opens your word and shares with us uh, the wisdom and the knowledge and the, of the grace of your word to us. We pray that hearts will be open to receive it, lives will be changed here today, and it's in your name. Amen. Would you stand and worship with us as we sing This Is The Day?
1 John chapter 1, beginning in verse 5, it says, This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sins. Let's remember this as we sing this next song called Just a Closer Walk with Thee.
It's not anything that we can do. It's only through Christ. Thank you, Lord, for the sacrifice that you made on our behalf. All the glory and the honor and the praise goes to you. Be with us now as we open up your word. Be with our pastor as he proclaims your word. Open up our hearts to your word. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. You may be seated. Once again, Matthew 12. Lord willing, we'll be in chapter 13 next week. We finish out this chapter this morning. And some of you, if you've read the title, you, uh, you might already have a character uh, from a particular television show that was kind of known for making this statement fairly often, hearing him say it maybe in your head right now. Now, I, I realize it's a, it's a common phrase. Think of my age, right? I'm 48, so about the time I'm a young kid, some of the television shows that might have been on particular character that might have said this phrase. Anybody got any guesses of who I'm thinking of? Wore a white suit, but he sure wasn't a good dude. Y'all don't remember Boss Hogg back in the Dukes of Hazard? Come on now. Don't you remember him? Every once in a while, some scheme would come across his way and there would be some kind of conflict, but he'd take that cigar and he'd part it off and he'd say, blood is thicker than water. That's what he'd say all the time. Don't you remember that? Now, I realize he would follow that up with, but money is thicker than blood. But hey, that's not the phrase I'm talking about. I'm talking about the first half. And why would I think of him, <laughs> of all things, in reading this passage of Scripture this morning is because it, it really is the culmination of where we left off last week. About the one who's not living according to rules and regulations so that somehow they might become holy no, it would be about the one who had truly believed, the one who had trusted in Christ, surrendered to the truth of the gospel, the one who had been born again, who was saved, living their life so that God may be glorified in it. And now the reality of that believer's life as they are part of a committed discipling family, a covenant family. And so the, the phrase that is... The title, this 
It's used in, in maybe a kind of an understanding, a metaphor with what Jesus is saying here. It's truly an old phrase. I mean, J.D. Hogg didn't come up with it. Y'all know that. If you go digging around to find out the origins of it, you, really you're immediately faced with some, some pretty bold disagreements back and forth and kind of the idea that really no one knows the origins except for those who are claiming about it. I mean, th- this is... He would use the phrase, um, meaning our beloved character from that television show, he would use it to, to allude that family bonds are to be stronger or to have priority over other friendships or other relationships outside of family ties. Interestingly enough, part of the controversy over the origin of that phrase presents a longer version of this actually stating the opposite. The, the longer version is the blood of the covenant is thicker than the water of the womb. Now, the great controversy over this longer version is that it is touted by some to be the original version, and then the shorter is expressed by our white-wearing suit, greedy villain. But that's somehow the more modern understanding. But then you can read that the longer version is the modern expression, while the shorter is the original. Listen, I'll just ask the question, does it matter which one came first? Not to me. <laughs> The longer version might seem to resonate a bit stronger with some of you, given that we as Christians understand that our Lord Jesus issued a new covenant between God and man by the shedding of his blood. So that longer version would encompass the greater and broader picture of the family of Christ rather than the shorter version seeming to limit it or first priority only to blood relation. But today within the text, I think we will see kind of which understanding our Lord seems to hold. And so then for us, what truth are we to glean from this passage and apply to our lives so that we might have a clear testimony of Christ and his people? Let's read together Matthew 12, the last few verses, starting with verse 46, go through verse 50. It says, while he was still speaking to the people, behold, his mother and his brothers stood outside asking to speak to him. But he replied to the man who told him, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? And then stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Let's pray. God, thank you. For the day, thank you for the gift of it. Thank you for your, your mercy brand new this morning that we might gather here. Thank you that we know that you are with us now. Whether our feelings resonate with that or not, whether our emotions are filled or empty, and whether or not our bodies are feeling uh, well or not normal, it has not changed the reality that you are unchanging, that you are good, that you are sovereign over this day, that you have already made provisions for us through the grace and mercy that you have provided for us in Jesus, all ready for whatever may come, even though we are completely unaware. And God, we thank you for your long suffering, even, even so that this morning, some of us may have come from a, a genuine time of rebellion against you. And yet you've kept us, held us, brought us so that we might be reminded again that you are our God and that your blood being shed is a tremendous family bond for those who have received you as Lord, who have trusted in you as their Savior, who have come to you for the only forgiveness that we might be able to obtain that is secured because of your life and your death and your resurrection. And this morning we might see that the family of Jesus through his blood is a strong and eternal tie that we ought to be joyful, thankful, and Lord, that we should work as best as we can in sharing the grace and mercy that we have from you with each other. And Lord, for those maybe in this hearing that have not trusted in you, have not placed their faith in you, 
have not received eternal forgiveness by surrendering their life to you, turning from that, then, God, I pray this morning that the encouragement of knowing that we don't just get heaven, but that we get a heavenly family, Lord, that that even more so is um, something that might break through the hardness of their heart, that they might know that you provide everything that we might need, including the fellowship that our hearts long for. Thank you again um, for the sunrise. And with the rest of this day, may we honor you with what we say and do, because it certainly is for your glory and for our good. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. First point this morning is simply to, to define real family. What, what is the real family here that Jesus is speaking of here in the end of Matthew chapter 12? Let me just stop for a second, though, and if we can, the very first thing that we can address is just so there's no confusion. I'm not sure what version that you hold in your hands of the scriptures, but there are some that start verse with 46 and then they jump right to 48 and 47 is not included. You may not have even been aware of that, but now that I've said so, you go back and look. Your Bible may have verse 47, it may not. I simply want to, to clear up any confusion that might be because, well, what, what does it say in Matthew 12, 47 if my Bible doesn't have it? Here's what it says. It says, someone told him, your mother and brothers are standing outside wanting to speak to you. That's what the verse would say. And so they, all the more you might be saying, well, that doesn't sound very controversial. Why doesn't my Bible contain uh, this verse? Well, the reasoning is, is that it's not in some old manuscripts. Two of the earliest dated manuscripts of the Bible that we have, Codex Sinaiticus, Codex, Codex Vaticanus, now found in very different time periods, both though dated to the fourth century, neither one of them have verse 47. Now, one reason is given is that for the fact that both of those verses end with the same phrase, wanting to speak with you or uh, coming to speak with you, that verse 47 might have been omitted by mistake. The other comes down to your view on those early manuscripts, meaning if the earliest manuscript that we have does not contain that verse, then it doesn't matter. We don't put it in the newer version. And some would say, well, look, it, it may not be in this, but in the majority of the other copies, verse 47 seems to pop up. We're going to let the majority rule. Now, I would simply say within that, that's not just a Bible thing. That is a, a transmission principle that they do for all ancient texts. And it's it's however they uh, view in, in, in putting that, that document together or that modern version together. So I just want you to know it doesn't take away um, for, from the, uh, the, the authority of the scriptures. Certainly verse 47, whether it is included or excluded from your Bible, does not cause any confusion about the account that it's involved in. It doesn't strip away the authority, uh, who Jesus is described to be within these verses. It doesn't contradict with any other scripture in both containing or excluding verse 47. So for us today, we don't have to panic. We don't have to fear. We don't have to worry that somehow if verse 47 is not in my Bible, then it must not be a godly translation. Don't do that. I mean, yes, there are, there are versions of the Bible that seem to be um, better uh, understanding, certainly more of a, of, a, of, a, of a word for word where we can glean what the original authors were intending for us to, to say. But, but, but I don't know of um, a common version of Scripture uh, that is uh, anti-God other than uh, the ones that we know that certainly have been uh, edited and created for their own denomination, like the Jehovah's Witness Bible, uh, that has been rewritten in a way to describe Jesus as um, not part of the Godhead, but as simply a creation. And there are others, of course, within the Mormon religion that they have rewritten uh, some verses. Uh, but if you were just to pick up uh, an, uh, an ESV or a CSB or a KJV, uh, the King James will contain verse 47. Your ESV probably does not. But even in that, that, that verse being included or excluded doesn't change anything of the authority of the Scriptures. It certainly doesn't change the understanding of who Jesus is. And so we don't have to worry on this one. We can read Matthew 12 with confidence 
on what God was meaning to convey to those earliest readers of this gospel. And we can understand it is the same thing that we are understanding today. Now, if you wonder how you can easily reconcile, even if your version does not contain Matthew 12, 47, you can look in Luke chapter 8, starting verse 19, and it says, Then his mother and his brothers came to him, but they could not reach him because of the crowd. And he was told, your mother and your brothers are standing outside desiring to see you. In verse 21 of Luke chapter 8, he says, he answered them, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. So we can easily know who this group is and who had come to see our Lord. We're actually going to read it in chapter 13, Lord willing. Uh, Verse 55, it says, is this not the carpenter's son? Is this not his mother? Uh, Is not his mother called Mary? Are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? So we have this group here in chapter 13 that they've shown up here at the end of 12 asking to see Jesus. Now it's fair to ask, why was Jesus' mother and brothers coming to see him? Uh, You know, we might be thinking maybe they've come to to listen. Maybe mama's bringing him lunch, you know, like mama's do. No, it's, it's actually a little different. In Mark 3, we get this account from the gospel in his perspective where it says, then he went home and the crowd gathered again. So here he is. As he's traveled, this, this crowd continues to build and follow him. And it was, it was such a crowd, it says in, in verse 20, it says, so they could not even eat. That's how, that's how thick this crowd of people was around him. Verse 21 in Mark chapter 3, And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, He is out of his mind. Talk about a supportive family, right? You ever had your family go, Whoa, 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 you are talking crazy. Now listen, you... Well, I don't mean genuinely, Steve. I mean, sometimes it's... A, it's I understand we, we get around our family and they think we've gone crazy. I mean, as we talk about our faith in Christ, but think about it. Think if you were the one saying, I'm God. We would probably have some family members saying, we need to keep a watch on him. Now, I'm not saying this to somehow discredit the the authority of Christ or his testimony. I'm simply simply giving to you what, what is given to us. And this is his real family wrestling with the fact that their own brother... Is, de- is declaring himself God in the flesh. And they did not automatically receive this. Just like some of you, the first time you ever heard about Jesus Christ, how could one guy die for all these people so long ago on one cross and somehow it makes uh, atonement for my sin? That sounds a little bit far-fetched. And, and remember, they're, they're looking for a Messiah that was coming as a warrior, a, a king, not, not my brother. <laughs> so, so for them to... To hear what Jesus is saying, to, to know that there is obviously the miracles being performed by his hands. But, but even now, this crowd drawing near, they just couldn't wrap their minds around him. Not just being a good prophet, not being someone God had used, but to say that he is greater than the temple, greater than David, greater than, than anyone that, that they might have known from Jonah and all others, that this is this is a little much. We, we need to go get him. We need to go talk to him. And so here he is with his mother and his brothers looking for him, trying to find him, trying to take him out of the crowd. They, they were concerned about the attention that he was drawing from the Pharisees, those far and wide coming to see this Jesus of Nazareth and, and the miracles he was performing. But now, just to simply say, he's not making the distinction between blood relatives and spiritual family here out of spite he's not he's not poking back at his family no jesus makes the distinction for the benefit of those who were in his hearing that day and even for us to know that it is not a particular lineage that causes you to be saved i know i've i've said this before it's amazing to me the number of times i hear it Uh, somehow I don't know when it was, but somewhere between 1930 and 1950, there must have been more preachers in the United States than we could have shaken a stick at. Because everybody always says, my grandpa was a preacher. 
I don't know where that grandpa preached, but I don't know, churches may have had 10 or 12 preachers at once because my grandpa was a preacher is probably the most common phrase that I hear. But it doesn't matter if your grandpa was a preacher. It it doesn't automatically save you. This is what the Jews struggled with. Well, and some Baptists struggle now because grandpa was a preacher. Their thinking was that They were part of a particular family line and God would surely have automatic mercy on them. In Romans chapter 9, starting with verse 6, it says, But it is not as though the word of God has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. And not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This, This means That it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. See, Jesus is giving a better understanding of what it means to be a real part of the family of Christ. It is those that have received him as Lord, have trusted in him, that in his testimony of being the one who has come, who has lived, who has fulfilled all the law, who then died in our place as an atonement, a complete propitiation, as the scripture says, that it would appease the wrath of God on sin for man once for all time, not a sacrifice over and over again, year after year, that they would bring the, 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 the bulls and goats and the sheep, that they would spill their blood that was not a permanent atonement, but it would be the blood of the perfect man, the one who was both God and man, who would give his life that we might have a new family. In Matthew 12, again in verse 49 and 50, stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. There is a distinction, and it is not based upon our family name. It is based upon our eternal name and who we are. But not just real family, but what is the family life? What is expected from us? Because when Jesus is speaking about those people being a a member of his family, there is an instruction there. There there is a, a place where not just to say you've become my family, but they will show themselves as my family by what? By doing what my father wills, by following his commands. It does not make them the family, but because they are a part of the family, then they will live as they are family. So in our family life, let me read from the book of Titus chapter two. It is not unfamiliar to us, but it is one of the passages of scripture that I think encompasses the the picture of the church today and the family of God and what we are to be, not just for each other, but for the outside world. It says, but as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good. And so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Likewise... Urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Show yourselves in all respects to be a model of good works. And in your teaching, show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned. So that an opponent may be put to shame having nothing else or nothing evil to say about us. So what are we to do with and for each other? Well, the first thing that we're given within this passage here is we're to teach. I mean, Paul's instructing Titus to teach a way of life that accords, works with, complements, or we would say a life that follows sound doctrine. We too, all those who claim Christ as their Lord, God as their Father, we are called to teach this life to other believers. It should be a natural process. It's a standard by which we Advise, or rather give true wisdom to those around us who are a part of the family. But now listen, you can only teach what you know. 
It's to be where we know it well enough that we're able to teach it correctly. This is not teaching traditions. This is not teaching preferences. Don't forget, the entirety of chapter 12 already has spoken of the Pharisees' legalism. Their idea of what makes us holy and what we do completely contradictory to the fact that Jesus is saying he himself is what makes us holy. And then we live a life that looks holy or set apart because we are grateful and gracious and we are equipped and empowered by his spirit to live a life that looks like him. Now there's a a charge in Titus 2 for the older to teach the younger. We automatically accept fathers and mothers teach children, grandparents they, they continue to teach or lead their children or their grandchildren as they lead their own families. It's to be done together alongside the church family. Neither one should be leaning on the other to carry their own responsibility. Now, this is a tough one because in our modern culture, we have, we have somehow in the church taught our families, don't teach yourself, lean on us. I mean, I I have given the example before, but in one of the churches that I served in, I'd found an old directory somewhere in the early 80s is when this one was dated. And before you ever got to the pictures of the members of the church, you open it up on the first page and it said, call your pastor was on the top of the page. And it began to give a list. Having a problem in your marriage, call your pastor. Wanting to someone to know who Jesus is, call your pastor. If, if you're needing something to, to be prayed for, call your pastor. Everything, probably 25 different things within that page that every one of them, the answer was call your pastor. Now listen, I love to be told what's going on in your life. I want to be there for that. But let me tell you, if everything was left up to me, y'all would be in a world of hurting. I, I can't fix everything for you. I mean, I I suppose within that list, it could be you can call your pastor, but then the two of you need to be calling on Jesus. And then we can gather the rest of the church family together. However, it's applicable of them being able to pray with us. And if their resources can help the problem or whatever it may be, then it is to say that Jesus is our answer, not your pastor. Some of you are relieved when I say that. That's good. I I, I want you to be that. But, But this is where we are to be together, not leaning on the other to carry the responsibility. Family teaches family. Friends teach friends. This is done when both older and younger reciprocate the desire to learn and grow, not just in knowledge, but in true wisdom. Wisdom is is making that godly choice. Remember, it's not a moral choice. It's a godly choice. It's how I'm going to honor the Lord. It's how I'm going to obey Him in this. It's not about my reputation, my comfort. How do I keep the name of Jesus and his testimony high as I walk through this this time in my life? Maybe if I've never, ever walked through it before, I can still walk and live wise. And all of it to be done in a way that that glorifies our Lord. Listen, think of that instruction here, though. Teach what is good. So then here's the question. What's good? (laughs) I mean, how do I know I'm teaching the right thing to say what, what is defined as good? Well, in Mark chapter 10, it says that Jesus was setting out on his journey and a man ran up to knelt before him and said, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus turns to him and says, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Well, there's our answer. God is good. So what are we called to teach? God. (laughs) Can that be specific? Well, of course, we can glean from the scripture who God is, how God has revealed himself through his word. He is described as creator, father, king, savior, help, guide, comforter, friend. He revealed himself through miracles and prophets. And as the scriptures do tell us in these last days, he revealed himself through Jesus Christ, his son. The more we know God the more we're able to share him. And that sharing is teaching. It's not, it's not meant to just take place in the form of a class or, or some formal gathering. Certainly it's done on Sunday mornings here through Sunday school, our time of worship. But it's done in all kinds of moments in life. I, I was reminded from uh, a, a fellow this, this weekend that uh, he can talk to God just fine when he's in his deer stand. Some of y'all fellows are going to give an amen on that. 
I mean, he went so far as to say, look, when I, I'm up in that deer stand, I'm closer to God there than I am when I'm standing down here on the ground. And I can't deny that. Now, we also had the discussion of if we are truly part of God's family, we don't deny the fellowship with each other as well. But you know what? God's up in the deer stand as well, isn't he? He's on the highway when we're driving. He, he's on the side of the road when we're walking along and getting some exercise. He, he's in the conversation with us and our family whenever we're trying to, to teach something good, to, to have a good example. And he's with us when we are distressed and at our wit's end where he is holding us and keeping everything in place so that we remember that he is good. So we're to teach him. And it's in all moments of life. This teaching can also be a part of what we call discipling. Those qualities given in Titus 2, verses 2, verse 3, verse 7 and 8, those terms like sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, sound in love, steadfastness. Be reverent in behavior, not slanderers. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works, and in your teaching show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned. Man, I tell you, that's one thing that my mom and dad tried to build in us as children is to somehow speak in a way like Proverbs 15 would tell us that a, a kind answer or a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh answer stirs up trouble. I mean, that's wisdom, right? It's not karma. And if you're short with someone, you're critical with them, you start off by calling them a name, they're probably not going to return a Oh, okay, let me hear what you have to say. They're going to be defensive. They're going to be frustrated or upset with you automatically. But if we can look at these character traits, this, this kind of teaching, it's not done haphazard. It, it comes from the one who has a firm grasp on who God is, what pleases him. And the desire is to teach what, what doesn't surpass from our desire to live it out. In other words, it's not just for our brains to know. It's so that our heart experiences the good blessings that God gives, the joy, the peace, the courage that comes along following Him. True teaching doesn't, doesn't just come from the head. It comes from the heart. And of course, there is knowledge, but the conviction, the understanding comes from true teaching. Well, that is something that is both known and Trusted, and we are called to teach those things. We're also called to learn. Proverbs 12, 15 says that the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. I want you to think of it here. Paul, writing to, to Titus, that how he is to instruct and teach and show his own maturity to his people so they might be able to pass it all along. I mean, have you ever noticed and wondered that that some, even though they may be younger in years, that God has given them a, a character of wisdom. That doesn't come automatically. That's them submitting to God and learning, not just the word, but actually being able to apply it. You know, it's the difference between someone who's got a lot of book smarts and someone who's just able to adapt as life comes along. You, you know the difference between those two. Uh, if you watch uh, All Creatures Great and Small, I don't know if you watch that show. If you don't, you should. It's a great show. Uh, who knew a show about a, vet, uh, a veterinary clinic would be um, an amazing uh, television show, but it is. It, it's, it takes place pre and right around the time of World War II, and, uh, and it's based off of a true story of a, a gentleman who was a um, veterinarian who eventually came over to the States, but in this television show, in this current series, um, there is a, a character that's introduced, and he is... He is as smart as anybody comes, book smarts. He can recite the names of bacteria and he can recite the names of diseases. And when he gets out into the, the farm field with the other veterinarians, uh, he has got a terrible bedside manner and he's just blunt and he's, he's harsh with the people and he, he just doesn't take uh, anything into uh, account. And, and that's the difference that, that this is trying to be here when Paul is saying to Titus, look, it's, it's not just pointing out sin, it's it's helping them up. It's walking alongside with them. It's being able to show the difference between just following a list of rules, but being able to say, but our hearts are turned toward the Lord Jesus. We're, we're called to learn with each other. This is so that, so that we're not 
I don't know, envious of each other. We're, we're, we're submitting to each other. Read it again, Titus 2, starting with verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Listen, the practice of living an upright, self-controlled life among both believers and unbelievers, it ought to be a joy for us, not a burden. If you're viewing it as a burden, what you're doing is you're viewing the, the Christian life as a bunch of rules that I've, got, I've just got to follow these things. I've got to do these things. Listen, it, if you go back to Colossians 3 and you're reading about putting off the old man and putting on Christ, I want you to rem remember it this way. It's not about just putting on gentle and compassionate hearts. It's not about just putting on this, this, this truth for others and this zeal for good works. It's not about putting on actions. You put on Christ. Why? Because Christ is compassion. Christ is joy. Christ is our courage and wisdom. So we put him on. We don't just put on an action. We remember each day is his, that he's the king, that he's the one ruling over all things. He's the one making provision for us. And when our hearts are turned toward him, then we are able to imitate our Lord Jesus. That is all a part of learning, and we're called to receive that, to act on that, to grow in maturity. That's what it means to be holy. Holy doesn't mean that I get it all right. Holy doesn't mean that I... I do more good than bad. Holy simply means set apart. It means other. It means your, your first reaction is not like the world. Your first reaction is, how am I going to honor Lord, the Lord in this? How, how am I going to honor my family in this? How am I going to uphold um, uh, uh, honor and, and love and, and gentleness? How, how am I going to be someone who, who shows Jesus Christ in my life rather than just myself? So along with that, learning and teaching and seeing that then we truly we truly are able to say that we are a part of the family of God Titus chapter 3 verses 3 through 7 says for we ourselves were once foolish disobedient led astray slaves to various passions and pleasures passing our days in malice and envy hated by others and hating one another but when the goodness and the loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared. He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of the eternal life. Listen, the Bible's really clear. When a person confesses Jesus as Lord and Savior, they are born again into God's family. We then are not only a member of the family, we are to live as a member of the family. A community that is bound by the shedding of blood, that blood of a covenant. Now, whether that longer version of that phrase is actually the original, which I'll be honest, as far as what I found, it's the short version that seemed to have come first. It seems like it's shown up even in some German writing as early as the 12th century. And that longer version, the blood of the covenant is, is uh, thicker than the water of the womb, seems to turn up somewhere in the you know, 19th or 20th centuries by a Christian. But you know what? It makes sense. <laughs> because family ties uh, are one thing, and we should honor our family, and we should take care of them. But but God's family, that's a, that's a tie by the shedding of blood that goes way beyond any, any name or any lineage here. Amen? This is part of God's family, living as part of God's family, a community that is bound by the shedding of blood, the blood of a covenant, a family bond that is not earthly, but it's spiritual, a family bond that is not temporal, but it's eternal, 
Jesus is the one who shed his blood so that we might be saved. He is the one who purchased and provided our adoption into his family by the death on the cross. We are to teach, we are to learn, we are to continually look to our Lord as our ultimate authority, provider for this family. And we are commissioned to grow the family. Now sometimes that happens naturally. Thanks Elizabeth and Pablo, we appreciate that. New baby, right? It happens that way. We we are to be fruitful and multiply in this world. But it's not just about having children. It's not just about being able to to grow your church family simply because you you have a lot of, of little ones running around. That's a wonderful thing. That's a blessing from God. And we should see our children as that. But it is to care for the family, to help the family honor Uh, our Savior and our Lord. It is to to go out and to witness and to testify to those who Jesus is that those might be brought into the fold to show again the mercy and the love of our Lord Jesus. Are you a part of Christ's family? Have you come to the point where you realize that you have nothing truly righteous that you can do or offer? Are you willing to trust in the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus, submitting yourself to Him so that you can receive His righteousness his salvation, and then live the life here on this earth devoted to Him, thankful for the grace that He's given you. I don't know if you're at that point yet, but I pray that you don't get to the bottom before you finally understand that this is, this is the only decision you really have, to trust in the Lord Jesus. If it's not, then today, I'm, I'm telling you, today is the day you're called to surrender to Him. And as for those of us who are Members of Christ's family here, a part of this family. The question is, are we, are we teaching? Are we learning? Are we walking alongside one another? Would Jesus stretch out his hand and point to you and say, this is my mother and my brother. This is my sister. This is my family. Why? Because I, I know in their life, it's not just lip service. It's not just showing up on Sunday mornings and then living a separate life. No, it's I see them. The every day, it, it matters to them that, that they're, they're acknowledging me. It matters to them that they remember that I'm Lord over all things. It matters to them that they're able to show their identity is not their own, but it's in me. That, that's, that's my mother, my brothers. That's my sister. That's my family. Is that you today? If not, I'm, I'm simply calling on you to look to the Lord Jesus and be saved. Become a part of that family so that, well, not just to know that you're never alone but that you can know that you have received the mercy and grace that is eternal life in Jesus Christ. And then you receive the family as well. Let's pray. God, thank you for that promising, uh, precious promise that we not only receive a, a place in eternity, but we receive a people. That we become a part of something greater than we can imagine even here on this earth. More than allegiance uh, to a family name, more than allegiance to a country, more than uh, anything that we could imagine is knowing that we have been bound together by the blood that was shed for us. Shed for us so that once for all time we might have an eternal home, one that will never be shaken, one that will never be broken, a body that will never decay or or grow old, an existence that begins to kind of blow our mind a little bit when we think about the fact that it will always be forever and ever, and yet, according to your word, God, that it will be better than we could ever imagine. Lord, I pray that this morning that those things are certainly not seen as the gospel, but they are seen as the blessings from the gospel. And that gospel being that we can trust you, Lord Jesus, with our life. That we can surrender to you knowing that what we would receive from you is better than anything that we could ever achieve on our own. That knowing that the only way that we are able to have redemption, justification, forgiveness, right standing before God is that we would confess you, Lord and Savior, that we would call out to you for mercy, that we would lay our lives at the foot of the cross, the one that you satisfied the wrath of God through your death, and that you proved who you are 
all God, all man, by your resurrection, knowing that you are seated right now at the right hand and we are waiting for your return. Lord, help us to see that as our foundation for each morning as we get up and rise so that the actions that follow come from a heart that is filled with thanksgiving, knowing that you have provided all things for us. We thank you for that. We ask your blessings on this time, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Stand with us as we sing a hymn of invitation, and you come as the Lord may be leading you. Gary will be leading MU, 6 o'clock in the Family Center, and then immediately after, choir practice continue with the cantata, and I know that Matt is still um, uh, giving the invitation of if you've not joined the choir yet and you want to, I think he said there's some seats open, he still has some books uh, for the cantata, so there's one for you, so come tonight, uh, and there'll be practice after our evening time together, and uh, that'll, you'll continue getting ready for that. Uh, don't forget, next week after church... Uh, because he loved us first uh, event for parents and children. Sign up for that. And then for those of you uh, senior adults interested in the movie, there's the sign up out there for you as well. Uh, let's pray. God, we thank you for this morning. You are good. Uh, you are gracious. Uh, you are uh, Lord over all things. We thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ. We thank you for knowing that we are not alone, not, not simply because we have you, your spirit with us, but that we truly have one next to us, that you have given us a family that we might lean on, walk with, to teach, to learn, uh, to come alongside and, and get a glimpse of, of truly what heaven will be like. And so God, I pray that you continue to, well, to, to give us wisdom in how we are to love one another how we are to help each other, uh, and in all things that we would show ourselves as a testimony of your grace and mercy uh, so others might know just who you are. We thank you for that. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.